I'm a uh, lifelong uh, entrepreneur. I've lived and uh, worked and had companies all over the world, from uh, Philippines to Belize. Uh, I work mostly within financial technology, but I've also had uh, nightclubs, restaurants, uh, event businesses. Uh, mainly this started because I'm an adventurer. I've been traveling around the world, uh, slowly moving from one country to the next to try to understand the cultures and what's needed to be done. Um, so that's uh, just short about who I am. So today we're going to talk about Web 3.0 and uh, some kind of entrepreneurial ethics. Um, so just to start things off, we have a lot of ground to cover today. Um, since this is an open webinar, it has to be approachable for everyone. Uh, but I also want you to have an uh, overview of what this technology can do and what it's about, just in case you're not familiar. So... Web 3.0, basing, uh, starting with uh, the internet boom of the 90s with the Web 0.1, which is basically means that information was static. It was presented by us who were sitting there coding. Uh, and on the other side was the recipient just receiving the information. Uh, later on came the uh, Web 0.2 uh, revolution. That meant that it became dynamic. We were co-creating. We were doing things together. We eventually got social media. And now we're venturing into 3.0 that... Quite frankly, no one has really uh, managed to get a definition for yet. We just know something new is coming. And it seems to be about distributed ownership of this material, uh, that we can all own a piece of the internet ourselves. Uh, it seems to be showing that we're going into an increased transparency period. Or hopefully we're going into that. There has to be much more interactivity. We seem to be able now to interact with the hardware in a, in a way that I've done before. Um, and what we're going to talk about mostly today is the blockchain technology that makes it possible to have a technology that is backed by math, not by name or trust. Um, so the uh, part of this that we, we will mostly focus on, as I said, is the blockchain. However, I am uh, part of various companies. I'm part of a metaverse company that uh, is... Uh, consulting for and helping companies like Meta. Uh, we uh, work with Fujitsu Siemens, IKEA, and a lot of uh, brand names to kind of show them what is possible to do on the software side of the metaverse. I'm not going to focus very much on the hardware side of anything of this. Uh, I also work with intelligence, artificial intelligence, but that is not my, my area of expertise. My area of expertise is the uh, bridging of the crypto technology and economy with the legacy economy as in the fiat-based monetary economy that we're uh, used to living in. And that is really, if, if we go deep into it, that is what it's all about. We have the capability now with crypto, with all the problems that's been going on for tens of thousands of years, how do we keep records without having a centralized power telling us that this is the correct uh, records? So what happened here is that we managed to get to a point where mass in itself was able to be behind us and do, and do the actual trust. So I can see in these records that are shared among all the nodes or all the people around the world that are participating in the system. Uh, I can see all the transactions going back and forth. Uh, I don't have to trust anyone who says, look at me, I have a big bank, I have a big building. Uh, what I need to trust now is uh, the records that they keep. So that's a, that's a basis of, of the blockchain. With the blockchain, which is really a software tool that we're talking about, that's like a distributed computer around the world. On this computer, you can run code. That code we normally call smart contracts. So it all started off with the blockchain for Bitcoin that was primarily just for financial transactions or to find a way to do financial transactions. And then Vitalik, uh, the founder of Ethereum, relatively quickly said, okay, why don't we just put every kind of contract that we can onto this ledger so we can do another type of ledger. After that, we had to start looking into what is called fungible and non-fungible tokens. Fungible in this meaning is just that they're all the same. Meaning that if I have a coin, just like any kind of fiat coin, it doesn't matter if I have this coin or another coin. 
They're all basically the same. It doesn't matter to me which one I hold. They have the same value. They're interchangeable. And then we have the non-fungible tokens that today, unfortunately, has become uh, synonymous with having a, a link on a, on a folder on the line to say that uh, you, you own a particular um, GIF. Those are the opposite. Those are the ones where each token represents a unique individual value, which could be a different type of coin. It could be a membership. It could be a piece of art. It could be tied to the real world economy. All of those things are then based on that layer that we had, the, the base layer of, of the blockchain. Then, of course, on top of that, we can start creating various kinds of apps. We have something called a DAO, which is a distributed organization on the blockchain, basically saying that we start and run our companies and voting and everything online. Um, so that has very big repercussions for or potential repercussions for entrepreneurs and moving forward. So I'm, I'm trying to put this into place just so that we can understand what this technology does and what it doesn't. So I'll go deeper into one of these or each of these as we move forward, but I just want to run through so everyone kind of gets a grasp of it. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> So if you're looking at any product or any company that you're trying to build, you're trying to provide something for a client that they need. Right now, you can look at this as, am I doing this for myself or am I doing this for someone else or for the greater good? If you're only doing it for yourself, then yes, short term, it might make sense to throw in any kind of hype word or any kind of uh, token just to say that, listen, I have this company and I have a token. And that's what we see in every of these summers when it comes to crypto. Every time that we had a, a fear of missing out, every time that it starts getting popular, we see a large number of, of companies starting tokens. Right now, I think we're, we're somewhere between 40 and 80,000 tokens um, that either needs to represent an underlying value uh, it needs to represent a currency or act as a currency or have some other kind of value that it adds. Otherwise, it's just that it's the hype. It's also important, though, to know that various countries have different legislation. India, for example, has had quite stringent legislation when it comes to uh, exchanges due to a large influx of, of uh, money laundering and, and, and corruption. Um, at least India is looking at it and saying, okay, we're, we need this technology, but we also need to understand what it's doing. And again, then if you're looking at the, the software, not the hardware, because if you look at the hardware, we have different layers. We have the computers are behind it. We have the nodes, we have uh, the infrastructure, the hardware that makes this possible. That used to be centralized or is normally centralized within a bank, government, or someone telling you that, trust me, this is the information, we'll keep it safe. You don't have to look at it, but we know that is correct. If you then distribute that into a lot of people, that means every home computer, every gadget, every uh, thing that has computing power could theoretically be connected to the dis uh, decentralized network node. That means that you're part of running the hardware for this system. Then on top of that comes the software. Here it gets a little bit tricky because the terminology hasn't been set yet. So we normally talk about layer zero, layer one, layer two, layer four. Um, layer zero is the, the actual code, the, the blockchain in itself, uh, like Ethereum, uh, Bitcoin, Polygon, all these various um, blockchain projects that you have out there. On top of that, then you have uh, what is normally the most famous ones, the tokenized aspects like BTC on the Bitcoin uh, chain. Uh, you have uh, ETH on the Ethereum chain uh, and all these things. The third level there is 
various kinds of applications that you can add on to this. So for the uh, people who know, you have the Lightning Network that makes transactions faster uh, between people. And that in itself is built on the same blockchain, but it has its own fenced off area that makes it more easy to handle, maintain. And you can make it faster, you can make all these changes. On top of that, you can have other types of applications, basically like a bank, financial institution, uh, contracts, and all these things. Uh, if you compare that to the legacy economy today, we will have the monetary system being the layer zero. You will have uh, the, the, the rupee or the dollar or the euro or such as the layer one. Uh, and on top of that, you will then start having Federal Reserve, banks, financial institutions. So if you're using a token, just like we're, we're, we're trying to use, let's say, uh, Bitcoin, you're using a token to represent transactional value. Because all of these just represent information in one way or the other. If you're using that for, for a financial transaction, then that is basically the same as a computerized decentralized currency, which is, for example, Bitcoin. We don't really have any other uh, decentralized uh, currencies out there that are, that are running a large enough node to be properly seen as a, a non-centrally run currency. Why I'm bringing that up is if you then look at the financial sectors, Anything that we have in the financial sector today will be needed moving forward if we move over to a blockchain economy as well. That means whatever companies, services that are used today will be needed in the future. All those, all those companies need to be transitioned or something else needs to come in its place. So you can start a bank, an EU bank, you can start a financial institute, you can start a... Uh, an insurance company or or any of those companies on the blockchain, just so that, that people uh, get an idea of this. To then move between various blockchain products, you have needed a bridge. That means that you need to be able to go from one token uh, to another or from fiat to a token. So this is where I came in initially as, as uh, an expert. I tried to get the legacy banks to accept crypto business. I tried to work with the government to create regulations so that banks would uh, feel comfortable enough to work with crypto. Because I thought it was going to be really difficult to build this whole new system if we couldn't transfer information and value from the old system to the new system. Um, that might have been right, might have been wrong. Um, we'll have to see moving forward. But to do that, we can either then go to a centralized or decentralized exchange, we can sell our coins, uh, we can get paid in another coin, or we can get paid in fiat. Fiat has normally up to now been the, the, uh, the method for people to come in and out of, of crypto. And there's a huge crackdown on banks within the sector again. It tends to happen uh, every winter we go through or sometimes it's created by the regulatory issues that creates the winter. But we are in that position again now where there's a huge opportunity to step up and solve uh, the bridge and the on off and uh, the on and off ramps so you can get in and out of crypto. So I run a company uh, out of Dubai that is called uh, Funded by Me. It is a uh, crowdfunding uh, uh, platform connected to a financial institute. Uh, the idea for this has been that we want to be able to prop up companies that have good ideas. We want to be able to raise money and help them throughout the process. Um, so I see a lot of companies running through. We have 30, 40 companies every week that come in on the startup side. Uh, asking for help. And then we have all the companies that we've worked in with uh, before, and we have the larger institutions and all this. This means I get to see a lot of companies. I get to see a lot of what the VCs are saying that they want to invest in. I get to see what the regular people uh, feel like they want to invest in. And I started this company 
and I decided to do it in Dubai because we have regulations. And I wanted it to be regulated so we can move forward. And I wanted it to be uh, possible to add in a tokenized aspect of that business. Unfortunately, 99% of the companies that come to us when, when there's a connection to any kind of, of crypto or blockchain technology are either downright frauds or more, uh, more commonly, they're companies that wouldn't work without a token, have no real value to have a token, but throw it in as buzzwords. And if that is not clear to people, if you cannot run this, if you cannot run the, the company without this technology, you probably cannot run it with. There are some exceptions, but most likely, if you cannot run it without, you cannot run it with. And I tie, I, I can use an example that I put here, uh, the influencer coin. Someone that I used to work with decided to get into the crypto scene and start creating coins, not because they were needed, but because he could sell them. So the influencer coin was supposed to be this coin that influencer used to pay and, and send money between themselves, which I guess could be, uh, it could be a, a value in that. Um, however, if your only value that you bring is that you've tokenized transactions of money, then you need to look at why am I doing this? Am I reducing the transaction fees? Am I increasing the value for the customer in some other way? Is there a large enough market to go around? Or, and part of my French, is this just another shitcoin? And in this case, I would say it is because it doesn't solve anything. It doesn't have a platform. It doesn't produce anything and it doesn't reduce anything. It doesn't solve a problem. And really, when it comes to entrepreneurship, this is what we come back to time and time and time again. You need to solve a problem. If you just throw up another product, a new Twitter that's a, a clone of Twitter, you're probably not going to succeed. If you throw out a product that makes other Twitter users say, hey, look at those guys. They've added all these services or they reduced all this cost or they added some kind of value to us that's big enough for us to go away from Twitter and into this new platform, then yes, you might have some kind of a value. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> I, uh, I hope I'm not going too fast or too slow for you guys. Um, <clears throat> Um, uh, a bit too sick to keep uh, a good toilet, I think. Um, so yeah, so you need to build value in the positions that you're 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 positioning yourself in. I'm going to throw out some business ideas in a bit. When I present those ideas, I don't normally even say blockchain. I don't say token, crypto, anything like this. I feel that the companies that we're building are strong enough not to have to, to do these buzzwords. I feel that we're creating value for all sides that is big enough. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> to be able to do that is why I was trying to go through the underlying technology so we can understand it uh, at least on a, on, a, on a simple level. If you don't understand the technology that you're using or someone in your company understand the technology you're using, it's also most likely not a good idea to be using that. Um, moving forward, we will see a number of things happen. As we move into this Web3 environment, we're going to put more and more and more information onto uh, the cloud or onto the internet. All this information needs to be secure one way or the other, because this is what the 
the underlying technology is doing for us and what the economy now is going into being based on is your data, is your information, your data. That data needs to be kept safe. If you put something onto a blockchain that is supposedly immutable, as long as that blockchain is distributed enough, that information will be secure and safe. And it won't be possible to change it. It won't be possible to manipulate it. However, if you put bad information onto that blockchain, you create a situation where that, uh, that information is secure, but it might not be accurate. To take a simple example of this, if we create, as many people are trying to do, a blockchain where you put your, um, your school credential, your your um, educational credentials, that will make it so much easier if you're trying to apply for a job or you're trying to uh, go from one school to another, from one country to another, um, because you're not going to have to go through this process, as I'm sure most of you are familiar with, of having to take actual papers, getting them uh, stamped everywhere and, and uh, going to the embassies and all this, just, just to be able to show someone and look, this is a, it's a true a uh, copy of, of my educational certificate. However, of course, if I buy myself a certificate from a school and that school has the capability of, of uploading that certificate onto the cloud, then we just validated um, a certificate that's fake or a degree that's fake by putting it onto the, the blockchain and therefore making it immutable, making it true, online. So shit in, shit out. And I take this as an example because every single project that I've seen so far that works with taking uh, information from the real world onto a blockchain forgets about this step. One, one way of doing this would be to transition from the system that we have today onto centralized ledgers. And then that information can be shared with non-centralized and centralized ledgers. That way you have digitized that uh, information, but you're still, uh, you're still backing that with saying that this or that university is backing my data or this and that uh, government is, uh, is uh, backing this data. Um, the same can be said for, for let's say, your, your uh, medical data and whatever data that you're working with. So here I'm going to give you the, the, the first advice if you want to move forward and create a company that is that really needs to be created, that there's huge value in creation of, and that is a privacy and information sharing tool. I normally say, uh, I've been trying to develop this for myself for a while. I don't have time to develop everything that needs to be done. Um, we need much more people to come in and deal with all these, these uh, projects and deal with all these solutions that need to be built. Instead of running off and building something that doesn't need to be built, let's make sure that we build some of these things that really, really need to be done. So again, I'm going to use a real world example to make it easier. If today you buy a Tesla, that car, like most of you would know, is a computer on wheels. It's a robot. It keeps uh, taking your data. It keeps track of most of the things that you do. Did you press the accelerator? How are you? Um, what kind of input are you getting into the car? It then checks how many accidents do you have. Based on that data, Tesla is then able to provide you with insurance that is not just based on your age and where you happen to live, but your actual driving style. And therefore nudging you into being a more safe driver to make sure that you get lower prices for your insurance. The downside here is that Tesla has all your information. They have a centralized network with all your information. That means it's, it's liable to be hacked. You have all these issues that you have with centralized um, uh, databases. But as a client, you might want the insurance company behind this to know that you're a good driver. 
but maybe you don't want to tell them how many children you have in the car. You might not want to share the the uh, the camera. You might not want to share your data at all. If we can find a blockchain solution that bridges again, I come back to my bridges a lot. If you can bridge those two needs, then that would be a huge product. If you can make it so that the centralized company that is the insurance company that has a logarithm or a, a, a way to um, calculate the, the risk profile of, of how you're driving and giving you a price, if you can provide that information without giving it over, just like I come in from my side and the, the, the insurance company will want to know, okay, what's your age? How do you drive? Uh, and all these, these data. And then with that data, they can say, okay, you're a category one, two, three, four, five risk and give you a price. The company doesn't want you to know how they get to that price. They don't want you to know all the time. It's all these secrets that we, we have in our companies. They don't want to know how we do the business. You on the other side don't want them to have data that they shouldn't have. You don't want that data to be transferred to their database where it can be hacked and stolen by, by other people. You don't want them to know data that's irrelevant to what they're trying to do. So if you have a layer in the middle where the insurance company comes in and say, okay, put this in your flash memory. This is the algorithm that we're using. No information is transferred to the middle layer. And the same from the user's perspective, the data needed is provided to that middle layer and they will match them together and tell the company, this is a category four, he needs to uh, be seen like this. And you will be told, this is a price you're gonna get from this company. I think this is probably the most important thing that we can solve. If we can solve how to have this information available to, to us at all times globally, but secure and we get to decide what of this information anyone else gets to see. It's kind of like when you go to the doctor, you can tell the doctor, this is how I feel. And there's no record of that. He will know, he will say, okay, this is what you need to do, but there's no record for anyone to steal unless he puts it into the computer afterwards in the, in the, in the files. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mentioned nudging before, like you can nudge someone to be a safer driver, but you can also nudge someone into buying things. You can nudge someone quite easily into uh, voting a specific way or doing one thing or the other. That's a huge risk. That means that the, uh, the democratic system could be at risk or already is at risk uh, if it's even present in most countries. It also means that our individual agency, our right and our capabilities to be free individuals is threatened. From a, uh, from a business perspective, that means there's a huge opportunity here for, for whoever can resolve this issue. You will do the world good, and you will more than likely make a lot of money uh, doing this. Um, the company that I happen to run, or one of the companies happened to run the crowdfunding and financial institution. I wanted to have the crowdfunding aspect there to help people come into entrepreneurship to get educated about what we're doing and to have a possibility to invest on the same conditions as the big boys. The crowdfunding aspect of that is peer to peer. It's Company to peer to peer. It's the same thing here. If we can put in blockchain technology, we could, for example, reduce the transaction cost as long as you stay within our system. You don't have to pay every time that you're you're making a purchase or every time you sell. We're also trying to connect this into the centralized database that the government is running. And through that, be able to say, we have taken a 
share certificate. There used to be a piece of paper that was stamped and documented and all these things. And we turned that into a token. All the information needed for the sales and purchase and transfer of these assets is there. The difficulty so far in this is that the connection between the physical asset and the non-physical asset, the token, is only there because of a contract written. The upside is that if that blockchain disappears, the share certificates are still registered in the centralized government database. The downside is how do we prevent double spend in this case? How would we make sure that no one sells the equity aspects without selling the token? It's the same if you want to go into real estate. We can tokenize anything we want. We can say this building is now uh, tokenized. We split it into these tokens and you can invest in it. How do we make sure that that is really tied in with that asset? That's a huge thing that, that needs to be uh, addressed. And it's a, and it's a massive opportunity uh, to move forward into. So, then if you guys have The, the, another issue that we have within the within the business community is that if I give money to a company, I might be able to somewhat influence what they're doing through uh, uh, my shares, my votes. But a lot of the time, it's the largest shareholders are able to put someone on the board that's supposed to represent your rights, but it's an indirect form of governance. If we use a DAO, a distributed autonomous organization, we can put all those voting systems, transparency systems, all of that into a smart contract. The potential of, of running that way is giving the investors much more power and leverage. With that, you can put in whatever rules you want to, and you can also put in what well, we today have the compensation packages, but you can also put in uh, ways of, of pulling your money back. You can have a vote to say, listen, it didn't work out. Let's take the money back. You can put into effect various uh, controlling aspects saying that, yes, we have all this money in the bank account, but we'll only give uh, the mandate for you guys to use a certain amount of money. All of this is possible within the non uh, tokenized economy, the non-blockchain economy, just makes it a lot easier for everyone involved to kind of move forward and, and keep control of what is happening and keeping engaged with our company. Another thing that really needs to be solved is, of course, the, the global financial system. That's what I got into blockchain all the way back in, 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 in 2009 when it came out. We can either look at that as we need to solve the entire financial industry problem in one go, or we can look at it, okay, we need to solve this in, in many, many small ways. Like I said, I got into this and I really wanted to make sure that we have the bridges between the banks and the crypto companies. We are now in what is called uh, chokehold two where the, uh, especially the American government, but the UK government, some other governments uh, are starting to feel uncomfortable again uh, with this asset class and with this technology. Uh, so we have a crackdown on banks that are willing to work with crypto companies. And we've seen especially two of these banks uh, in the US called Silvergate and Signature. Silvergate very quickly, a few years ago, started taking on uh, the crypto industry and the tokenized industry, uh, providing them with a banking alternative. There's only been very few banks around the world that have been willing to do this properly. What they then did is they also built a system called the SEN network, the Silver, uh, sorry, uh, Silvergate Exchange Network. I'm bringing this up because what they dared to do and what they, they, they had the balls to do is that they offered through this network, they offered 
clients to tokenize their assets in the bank. So more or less creating a stable coin backed by whatever money you had in your account. That means that it's a it's a hundred percent backed by dollars. It is uh, therefore there's no peg, there's no no risk to be be taken. It's a proper stable coin. Then they allowed for the clients of the banks to use a twenty four seven network to be able to send money back and forth to each other. This is not difficult. This is a very simple uh, technology. But it's also seen by the traditional financial system as a threat. To have 24-hour transactions, I, I think most people around the world nowadays, or a lot of people around the world, are able to do transactions within their own bank. If I want to transfer money from my account to a family member that has an account in the same bank, I don't have to wait for opening hours. It's inside of that bank. They have their own centralized accounting system within the bank that makes sure that this is happening. So if you have uh, the skills for it and the connections to do it, we need a bank to, uh, to step in. We need a, someone to step in and create this service that was just taken away from the industry. There was a second bank that did something similar. Uh, Signature Bank created something called Signet. Um, pretty much the same thing. You were able to, to transact in, in crypto as well as in, in uh, US dollars 24 seven. Uh, massive, huge opportunity for, for anyone who wants to, to uh, go into that and, and feel that they have a, a, a capability of doing that. I'm just mentioning some of these because I want there to be an understanding that there are infinite possibilities right now. Almost, if, if, if we're going to if we're going to believe for a second that the blockchain technology is going to be as transformational as the internet was when it came in the first uh, time, we used to say back in the nineties that every single company would want to be on the internet. They will, they'll want to present themselves at least on this static web point one. It took longer than expected, but it happened. Every, every bigger company or, or, even person with social media has an account, has information, and is on the internet presenting. If we're now looking at a, a new revolution in this way, and pretty much every company in the world are going to want to be part of this one way or the other, that is such a massive opportunity that we don't have to create hype products. We don't have to go in and, and build non-value companies. If you do that, you're going to waste your own time. And if you do it for mal intent, you might come out with some money. Regardless, you're, you're going to slow things down and you're going to make it much more difficult for the people trying to build real value. We see this with FTX. FTX was... Uh, to, to most people in the, in the business, FTX was a clear... Um, I have to choose my words carefully here. There, 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 it was clear that something was not right. Uh, some companies start off in, in with, with good intent and turn bad. Some go the other way. The biggest exchange in the world has a very murky past and are doing things around the world that are, are, are very dubious. Um, but now they're getting regulated and they're, they're potentially helping bring the business forward. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> I'll uh, jump over to, uh, to the Q&A in the chat to see what you... Uh, um, 
you're asking. Um, uh, is it true that we put low value, we will get more over time? Uh, so Sanjit, if you would, wouldn't mind uh, uh, rephrasing that question, it's difficult for me to understand. Can Bitcoin be separated from the blockchain? No. Um, the blockchain is the ledger that keeps track of where everything is. And that is where the Bitcoin is. You, you cannot withdraw an asset or, or a Bitcoin from the blockchain. I'm... You are able to use it offline. You don't have to be online with the blockchain. I can, for example, I can... Uh, the, so, so Bitcoin is only really, um, like I said, it's the, the information that's being kept on the blockchain. When you have a Bitcoin, you get a code that you can use to show I am the real owner of this, this asset of this Bitcoin. And with that, I can transfer it to someone else. That means you can take those codes and you can put it on a piece of paper and you can walk around and you can give that piece of paper to someone else, just like cash. And that transaction will not be registered on the blockchain, but you still have access to that, to that Bitcoin, it's yours now. This is actually a very good and an interesting question. My belief when it comes to Bitcoin is it was, if you look back to the original uh, Satoshi vision or the original document, what is outlined is a currency that is, uh, is, is potentially meant to be used instead of the financial system that we have now. It's, it looks like it was going to be mini payments uh, as well as larger payments. But because of how it's been implemented, so I'm, 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 gonna, I'm sorry that I'm jumping back and forth now, but to make this clear again, the blockchain or this information, it's just that it's information. It's software. It's a code. Even Bitcoin is software and a code. So if we don't update software, someone will find a way to, to disrupt that. They will find a way to hack it, uh, or we might just find that there's something wrong in the code that we need to fix. So Bitcoin today is not what Bitcoin was in 2009. It's changed. We had something called the block uh, wars about how much information should be in each block. Uh, and, and there's been all these updates that have been done. Currently, there are seven or eight people with the access and capability of changing the Bitcoin code. So in one way, it's a heavily distributed decentralized network where the compute power is being delivered by a lot of people around the world, miners and, and private individuals alike. However, it's centralized in the way that a, a very few number of people are able to change the code. They have the power to change it. The safety is that it would lead to a, a hard fork and it was split into to several units and you still have the information so you can hopefully restore that if someone would do it with malintent. But it's still true that a few people around the world have the power to change Bitcoin. It's one of the risk aspects of, 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 this, uh, of this asset. Uh, next question. Will blockchain settle transaction pass legal and compliance tests? So obviously, this again has to do with which uh, legis uh, regulation and, and jurisdiction you're operating under. It's diff uh, different in different countries. India has been, uh, in my point of view, quite wisely been been a bit more restricted. 
Um, other countries like Dubai has, has moved forward to create a framework for companies to work inside so they know what's legal and not legal, so they can actually move forward and work quickly. Uh, and the US has chosen uh, implementation by crackdown. So no one knows what the law is. But after a while, they look back and go like, well, what you did, uh, we don't think that was legal. So we're going we're gonna to give you trouble for that. Um, so just different kinds of, of, of legislation. Um, I haven't seen any reg legislation yet that has tied uh, real world assets to a token uh, in a way that I think will, will, will last. Um, but we're definitely moving in that, uh, in that direction. Uh, so, so what, one of the biggest hurdles working with defense and other government entities while working on IoT technology is data security on the cloud. Yes, for sure. With Web 3.0, do you think these agency might relook at sending their data outside of their premises? <laughs> you know, again, a very good question. You, you, you've highlighted the, the risk of data security uh, by pointing out the defense aspects uh, and IoT. I have an IoT company as well, of course. With, with, with the data we can bring in from IoT, uh, even if we're looking at, at private data, uh, that's a lot, and it's it's very important. When you look when you look at any kind of company that don't want to share that data freely, we need to protect it. If you're looking at defense, which to be honest, I think payment systems now are are part of the the defense uh, infrastructure, uh, and and a lot of things that haven't been seen as as defense and haven't been seen as government. Um, business before might actually become government business now um, because the, the, the risks are going to uh, gonna be so big. If, like uh, the country I'm in now, Sweden, uh, we, we, we've had some of our supermarkets hacked. We've had the payment system hacked, which means that suddenly you're in a store, you can't pay for anything because we don't really use cash. Cash here is very rare. Um, We really need to step up in this in every single way, every single way. Um, I believe that the data will be categorized more in, in, in an onion style where certain data will be open to the public, certain data will be kept inside of your centralized uh, ledger. Some data will be put on the, the uh, various kinds of blockchains and as I said before, my my what I think is is the the solution to this is that you don't actually send any data whatsoever. You have a middle layer that will will instead of collecting that data, it will look at that data and provide the information needed. Um, I think that's the way to go. There might be other ways of, of doing it. If you guys have a brilliant way of doing it, please, please, please step up and do it. Um, can we use BPM front end to a blockchain database for a secure workflow? Yes, for sure. Um, will blockchain affect the traditional banking system? I would say it, it already is. Um, it's affecting it in, in, in many ways already. Um, we see countries uh, like Saudi and Dubai, they ran uh, inter-central bank transfers with blockchain years ago. Uh, the banks are moving into this. Um, you might be familiar with CBDCs, the central bank di digital currencies. Um, very simply put, that means that the government takes control of the currency, but the currency that they take control of is programmable. What that means is that I can put in code saying that this money here is only valid for a certain amount of time, or this money can only be spent on a specific type of product. Um, 
it gives the government uh, a measure of control that was not there before. And also with that, the capability of uh, collecting huge amounts of data. Um, we see private companies like WeChat uh, doing this already. There are several Chinese companies that are able to look at your transaction data, your personal data, uh, and, and how you move around and all these things. Um, now we are potentially giving that power to the government. Sweden is another, is again an interesting example because here we we actually do believe still that we are the government. Um, we rule our own country and we feel that the political system is so small that it's still representative of the people. Um, because of that, we sort of trust our government, which means that it's going to be so much easier for them to implement a CBDC here than in, let's say, the U.S., where the where, where the, uh, the citizenship have a, a strong uh, feeling of doubt when it comes to uh, the government uh, and don't trust the government. Um, if we have a CBD, uh, C, that also means that uh, instead of a bank account, you will have a, a wallet, just like you do with any kind of, of, of other blockchain technology. So the government can just go out and say, okay, here is a wallet given to every single uh, citizen of this country. Um, and that means the, the financial system will become direct. Uh, in, because today, the governments mostly tell a central bank that they uh, they want some more money, that central bank creates that money, that then goes out to the commercial banks, the commercial banks and use that for fractional uh, banking reserves, uh, which means they create even more money uh, out of that original money. And, and that is done by uh, private institutions on the way that are making money out of this. Instead, we could in theory then have the government be the bank. Everyone has an account with the government. If you then want to do um, boosting on the economy, quantitative easing, whatever you want to do, you can just put money right into people's accounts. You don't have to uh, find some way to go around it. So yes, for sure, it's 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 gonna it's gonna affect the traditional banking system. And like I said, with Signature Bank and with with uh, Silvergate Bank that had the audacity to actually automate the system. They took the blockchain technology into the financial world and very quickly showed that, listen, we don't have to have these old systems running on basic and cobalt and, and you know, doing swift transactions around the world uh, on all these various uh, systems. We can run it on uh, a software that makes it 24-7. Again, being Swedish, this is hilarious to me because we've been doing this since the nineties. I mean, I, I can transfer, uh, I can transfer money within basically all the banks in Sweden instantaneously. I can transfer money to any citizens uh, in Scandinavia instantaneously at at zero cost. Um, th this is technology that's already here since a long time. We have digital identities. Um, in a way, we are already where. Uh, other people are afraid their country is going to go with the with the with the difference that we feel that we trust the government. Of course, that means whatever people come into power next inherit that system, and they might not be as friendly and nice. And you know, so so with power come great responsibility. Um, uh, next one: Will DeFi see better adoption in the future? Uh, does the need for over collateralized make it not so friendly to users? My thoughts on DeFi. Um, it is my belief that we need to have some information in centralized databases uh, for speed, uh, proprietary uh, information and all these things. Uh, but I also see that a lot of this uh, could be replaced with peer-to-peer -peer, um, systems. I don't really, I don't really see the added value and benefit to having 
uh, centralized organizations doing this. Um, even more so when it comes to, uh, especially when it comes to the financial aspects of, of, of blockchain and tokenized products. Uh, it's so easy with technology now to create peer-to-peer -peer transactional systems um, and where you're able to transact and, and, and go between different blockchains. So if I want to change one, let's say an, an Ether for a Bitcoin or whatever, I can, I can very easily do that on the DeFi system. The issue all the time has been how do you go with, how, how do you transfer your wealth from legacy banking fiat into the crypto scene to start with? You either have to, to take existing wealth and transfer that, or you have to create new wealth inside of the new system. So if we do not pay salaries and we don't uh, create the value straight onto the blockchain or straight onto this uh, system, we will need to exchange from the old system to the new system or exchange from the fiat, fiat legacy system into the crypto system. I think it's much, much, much better to do that in a DeFi environment. You can, what, what, there's going to be some trouble, some risks, some, some, some growing pains for that to happen. Um, but eventually, if you have the choice of a low risk, low cost transaction or a higher risk, higher cost transaction, I think most people will go with the low one. And the low one in this case will be DeFi. And this also goes back to what I started talking about before, where the system that we have today, even, even within some banks, you can't do 24-7 uh, transactions. Um, but they have their, their, their centralized information system, their ledgers, to see that this money is with your account. They don't have to run around and put, you know, a little pile of physical cash next to a sign saying this is the this is Marcus's money. And then whenever I, I transfer money to anyone else, they you know it's not like they run up there and move physical cash from one place to another. And between banks, it's the same thing. They just keep uh, their ledgers, and then every now and then, you know, they they update that system and say, okay, you know, I I own this much money from, from our bank is owed to that bank. Same with the countries. Uh, we put the, you know, we put the gold with, with Federal Reserve um, and we hope that we can trust Federal Reserve to keep that gold and not spend it and still tell us that it's there. Um, all of these risks are in that system of centralized governance. And as we've seen now with, with many of these centralized exchanges, when you move your asset into their system, they have control of that asset. They also, I mean, the, the most people do this because we have this feeling that we want to trust someone and not something. We don't understand the math. We don't feel comfortable with it. We want someone to tell us, listen, you're safe. It's all good. So we go looking at these banks uh, and then the government are saying, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. If something happens, we got your back. Um, if a transaction is made and it was faulty, you can get your money back. And that's what we hear with, for example, Bitcoin is that uh, its energy consumption is, is horrific. Uh, it's slow. It doesn't have enough bandwidth. Uh, it's it's uh, difficult to use, uh, which it is. Uh, a transaction that's been made, if you make a mistake, uh, too bad, which is all true. It's also true for the, for the fiat system, if, if you look into it, but it's all true. And that is where we can build all these companies and all these services on top of that. So I look at, at Bitcoin in the future as more of a settlement layer, meaning we're not going to pay each other. With, with actual Bitcoin, with, with actual Bitcoin transaction on the actual BTC uh, network. 
if I give you a little bit of money, that doesn't need to be written into the BTC blockchain. And that works just the same way as it does in, in, in the fiat world, where governments, banks, and lucky individuals will own the Bitcoin. But that will not move. It will be there as a settlement layer so that when I make transactions within the Lightning Network or whichever um, network on top of these blockchains, I will keep track inside of that. So if I built a transaction or bank system on top of blockchain, as long as you're on my blockchain or my bit of that blockchain, I can just move that money and, and those transactions around within the bank without having to move that money anywhere else. And if enough money then gets sent out of my system into another system, I then have to settle that at a specific point, And I do that with Bitcoin. That means that we'll see transactions of Bitcoins. One transaction would not be 0 0.00001 Satoshis. It will be a huge amount where where the Fed is saying, okay, we need to move $100 billion from, from ownership in, in this country to ownership in that country. Or we need to move uh, this many hundreds of millions of dollars from this banking system to this banking system. So there you have, you, you have the need for and, and possibilities of decentralized as well as centralized finance. So I think we will we will see both, but so many of these services can be done uh, automatically, which lends itself even better onto DeFi. Um, and I I think with with future programming we will find ways of of doing a lot of things. It is possible, for example, now to put NFTs as in gifts or you know whatever art uh, onto the the B two C blockchain. It wasn't uh, possible before. It is technically possible to do anonymous transactions or at least transactions where you don't know the amount of or the 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 type of information sent you just see that there's been some kind of exchange between a and b you wouldn't know if that is a a message saying hello or if it's a hundred billion dollars um so so you know th th this this technology is very nascent it's very new uh, and, and we're going to see so many different kinds of use cases and technologies grow out, uh, grow out of this. So. What are some of the interesting applications, use cases in the metaverse that you've come across? I, I have to admit that I'm, a, I'm still a bit of a uh, metaverse skeptic. Um, I didn't really jump onto Second Life, even though my country had an embassy there in the 90s. Uh, I feel that technology is nowhere near where it needs to be, especially not on the hardware side, um, to create a metaverse. Um, if we are to look at this and compare it to older uh, to, to history, the internet was driven largely by informational transactions and porn. Um, it is in my in my point of view is actually quite likely that we will see um, we will see metaverses offering either realistic or non-realistic environments where you can or you already are able to I guess uh, you you can create an avatar you can create a representation of yourself. Um, into that metaverse, um, that that kind of takes this whole gender, uh, race, and all that uh, topic a step further. <clears throat> As in, you can of course be be uh, you know you, you can create an, an avatar that's not tied to your your real life identity. Uh, if you want to, you could be a horse. Uh, you know, you you, you can be a chair. You can be whatever the, you, you want, um, and the humans have a tendency to push that and explore these in, in, in often uh, sexual or, or, or identity ways. So I, I think that what we're going to see for a while are 
uh, metaverses are trying to provide some kind of anonymity where people can go in um, and, and disconnect. I also I also think what we're also already seeing is high definition uh, rooms with screens that where you can try to submerge yourself. Um, we see a lot of benefits in mental health, for example. Um, we see even even simple things like uh, you know, putting on the, the, the hardware that we have uh, and trying to transport yourself into an environment that you feel is, is uh, beneficial. So, you know, if you live in a city, you can take a break and you can go and sit in a, in, in a room or even just with glasses on uh, and get uh, some of the benefits that you would get from, from let's say, being in the forest. Uh, so I think that that's something we're going to see as well. Um, and... What we're working on otherwise is uh, trade shows and presentations. Uh, here, if we would have done this presentation, maybe we'll do one uh, in the future through our, our metaverse system. Uh, you will all be able to see an avatar. You'll be able to see how many people are, are in the, uh, the the room. Uh, we might create an, an environment that, that uh, allows you to be physically present or through the metaverse and still have uh, a feeling and an interaction uh, possibility with each other. Um, th th there's a lot. I mean, obviously, there's a lot. You, you can do so many things with with uh, the metaverse. The, the biggest draw there as well is data. You, just like like uh, with anything else, you're you're going to give up uh, an amount of data that we that we just cannot fathom today. Uh, it, and, and what that would lead to, I have no idea to be honest. If CBDC goes mainstream, what about the federal system? Will it fail, or what about the existence of the IMF? Um, CBDCs are interesting. They they present a clear uh, upside and a clear downside. Uh, the downsides are mostly uh, power, centralized power. It, it it really you know it 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 so depends on which direction we 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 end up going in. Um, I I would say a CBDC would more likely strengthen the federal system, um, and make it easier for for organizations like the IMF. Um, it's like the federal system or IMF on steroids. Um, the IMF, so far the IMF has come in and said, we'll lend you this and that much money if you do the following steps. Um, now they can basically come in or they, with a CBDC uh, back or, or a token back uh, currency, they can come in and just give you the money because they can just take it back uh, with a push of a button or... Or uh, if they see that you're using that money uh, on weapons when, uh, you know, the IMF wants you to use it on uh, crowd control or whatever, uh, they can just make sure that that's the only way you can use it. Um, so, CBDCs is a re relatively new term, but this is also, like I said, I got into this because I, I believe in individual freedom. Um, and I think the financial system is is incredibly important, uh, and that information is pretty much all we have when it comes to individual freedom. And my big fear was that uh, governments would understand what's going on and either cut off the financial system uh, like they're doing now again with choke point uh, and or create their own version and then say, okay, all other versions of digital currencies are illegal or because we're, we're, you know, they can control the money. They can make sure that it's not used for transactions that leave the system. Um, if that happens, we can only hope that some countries are going to say, okay, um, just like now we have all these countries around the world saying that we have lower taxes to come here or we have less transparency to come here. Um, we could see countries like say that, listen, we have a, uh, CBDC, or, or or we decided not to have a CBDC, so you should come here uh, with your money and your wealth. 
uh, or they might be saying that, okay, so in, in the US, you're not able to use your money to buy um, uh, digital currencies, except for, for the, the Federal Reserve digital currency. Um, but if you, you know, if, if, if you move your money to India, it, you know, the Indian government might allow you to then buy Bitcoin. Um, if all the governments come together and say, hey, listen, you know what, we're not going to allow that. Or we might see uh, fractionalized systems. Uh, we could see the BRIC countries go together and create their own monetary system, uh, their own CBDC um, to be used within, within their countries. Um, we will most likely see um, specific CBDCs or chains for specific use cases. Um, so you might have a, a, a rupee that can be used for normal people, and then you might have a different rupee that's used for oil uh, purchases uh, or, or for whatever use. Um, we might see a plethora of different um, payment systems for different people, which is also a very scary thought. Follow up to earlier question, can we have a super user or controlling user using features of BPM tool um, in a secure workflow with a blockchain base? Yes, there's, I, I don't think it's any, uh, I, I don't see a technical um, restriction to that. I, I yeah, I, I don't see why that would not be possible. Um, How we can support as a blockchain for launch an NFT and deal with Indian crypto laws for monetization? Um, to be honest, I'm not up to speed with the latest uh, changes and regulations in India. Um, I mean, there, there are such blockchains already. Um, I, you know, I, I, I would just have to say that I'm, I'm I, I don't have enough, uh, I, I don't know enough for that to, to be able to, to, uh, to answer it. Yeah, we are done with the questions which we had in Q&A. Just running through some of this, uh, but yeah, it looks like we're we're. Uh... Yeah, we're done. All right, everyone. I apologize for uh, sniveling and and uh, being a bit. Uh, well, whatever I am, uh, I apologize for that. But I hope this uh, gave you something. Uh, if you have any additional questions, uh, please. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, I'm sure that Vimlesh will will uh, be able to help with that as well. Um, you've seen my details. Uh, so yeah, please don't hesitate. I get a lot of requests, uh, obviously, on, on LinkedIn and such. So if you are to add me or uh, try to send me a message or so, please put in the headline. Uh, you know, you can put Times Pro or something that I know that is related to, to this. Um, Otherwise, I'm I'm bound to miss it, or you know, answer you in, in twelve months' time. Great. So it was a thank you, Marcus, for your wonderful session. Uh, in fact, we have exceeded more than one hour because our session was so good, and a lot of people were asking questions on uh, a few things. So once again, uh, I really thank you, Marcus, for taking out your time and all the way joining from Sweden. It was a really insightful and wonderful session. Definitely we'll plan one more session. One hour is not sufficient to answer all the queries. So soon we should plan one more session for all our Indian audience. And thank you for everyone who has taken out your time on Saturday morning and joining us for this time for Tech Saturday Web3 webinar. And I have just posted our you know uh, uh, community link 
so in case in case if you have any doubts queries feel free to reach out uh, join our community and uh, we'll be uh, addressing all your doubts and queries and also the uh, recording of the session will be posting in our community so please uh, join for the more updates and once again thank you everyone and we'll see you on the next week with a different topic so see you soon take care everyone have a good weekend thank you very much you too